Well, hello there, YouTube, and welcome to another virtual painting session. Before we get started, I must mention this is not intended to be a lesson by any means. This is a virtual painting session, just like I mentioned before. And this is going to be uh, not on a fixed schedule, as I mentioned before. So I'm not going to be streaming these on any kind of fixed schedule just yet. Maybe in the future, if you're watching this as an older video, then Maybe I already have another fixed schedule, but but not yet. So this is the Rembrandt that we started a while ago. I don't even know, was it like a month ago or, or whatever, but it's definitely dry. Let me tell you that. This painting has dried, and if you're working with lead white like I am, uh, it's probably safer to use a palette knife to check how dry the paint is. If a little bit of the paint film comes off, then that means that you're, you need to let your painting sit for another day or two. Since this is a virtual painting session, I invite you to draw or paint along with me. I won't be talking and painting throughout the entire thing as much, and I will take breaks every once in a while. Uh, so, hello there, uh, Buzzwati. Uh, hello there, Pastel Butterflies. Uh, the, color, the color that I toned this with was just black and white. Uh, Alkid oil paint with a little bit of raw umber. So, just like the title says, we're going to go and start to put in the background color and we're going to introduce a little bit of uh, medium. So I'm going to start off first by saying that these colors are listed in the description box down below. Not too many colors here so I'll be just reading them out to you as I mix them. So I'm starting out with raw umber. This is Italian brown ochre. These are Rublev colors. And the background is kind of a nice warm brown. Uh, yep, this is oil paint. Um, the, the background is kind of a nice warm brownish. This medium here that I'm using is Venetian medium made by the brand Rublev. And I'm not sponsored by this brand. It's just a brand that I really like to use. I'm going to read the description of the medium out to you. Uh, it says Venetian medium is based on research that 16th century Venetian painters added powdered glass to their paint contains leaded crystal glass powder boiled linseed oil with small amounts of wax turpentine and lead so don't eat it uh, as long as you get it away from uh, your fingers and things like that you'll be fine okay so let's let's just see how this works for my background brush, um, so how grainy is the canvas? This is uh, Klassen's fine textured uh, single oil primed, actually no that's wrong, this is double oil primed single te uh, fine textured, sorry. This is not very ultra smooth, but it's not very grainy if that's what you're wondering. Um, and it is an oil primed linen, so once again I, I get that mixed up once in a while. So it is fine textured and a double oil primed is, is what this linen is. But thanks for the question. So since this is a vertical palette and I want to add a little bit of spike lavender, I'm actually going to add it to the brush. You don't have to do this if you're not using a vertical palette like I am. But since this is a vertical palette, I can't just add uh, spike lavender to it. Okay, so that on its own seems to be a little bit too, a little too warm. So I want to make it towards the blue, a cooler color. So I'm going to go with black. This is German Vine Black, which is basically like ivory black, but it's, uh, I think it dries a little faster, if you would ask me. It's a historical color. Again, made by Rublev. Let's see, uh, so I got to, all right, so okay, asks, whenever I paint, I always get bad grainy texture, how to get rid of it. So if you are, uh, at the moment, I can't uh, zoom, I'm gonna, I would have to stand up and look at the, I would have to stand up and adjust all of my stuff, but uh, okay, you have written to me. Please see the description box, I have the linen uh, listed in there. It's not the finest texture, but it is uh, It's pretty nice if you're doing portraits and things like that. 
Well, sorry about that. I can't. If I stand up and I adjust my camera, it's going to take me a while to set it all back up. Adrian, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you don't like to do master studies, this is a exercise in painting. Obviously, by no means am I going to say that this is an original of mine. It is originally painted, but it is a learning exercise, which is why I have the photo reference linked for you. Let's cover the other side. The liquid in the bottle is spike lavender. Thanks for the question. Spike lavender oil is my solvent. Hey Bezwati, how did you do the underpainting? I didn't do an underpainting, I just started off uh, like this, the stream from last time, I guess I should have linked it in the description. So last time I just did a umber drawing and then I went in with color. This is the exact same painting that I did on the last uh, YouTube upload, which was I guess almost a month ago now. been very busy with the online classes, so uh, that's also linked in the description box. I've been posting there uh, twice a week. I post two lessons a week in the online classes. Then I've been doing a lot of studio work. Uh, but I just set up a new spot in my studio, so I should be able to stream a little bit more, more frequently. Now I'm going to add a little more of the spike lavender to the brush. Now I'm going to have to make that mixture again. So if you're not drawing or painting with me, I definitely encourage you to do it. Otherwise you might get a tad bit bored as this is a virtual painting session. It's not going to be some action-packed thing that's going to be ultra exciting to watch. But if you want to hang out and ask questions related to art, of course, feel free. Hey Omar. Oh, no problem. I'm glad you liked the videos. Thanks for watching from Syria. So the background is the same colors. It's just uh, the German vine black. Italian brown ochre and raw umber, which is actually called French umber, so a little bit of diversity from where the pigments come from. Hey, Jaco. Hey Anna, have you ever painted with acrylic? I have. Um, I have a tutorial style video out on acrylic. I am by no means an expert in acrylic. I would consider myself uh, an expert in oil painting. Although some may think differently, but uh, I have been working for, with oil paint for more than a decade. So let's just add a little bit of paint as we go. So once I cover the background, some for the hat and a, and a little bit for the bottom down here, then we're gonna jump back into the skin tones, the more exciting stuff. Okay, let's see. 
What's the use of the liquid? Can I buy from Amazon? Good question, Buzzwati. Uh, Sorry if I mispronounce your name. It is spike lavender oil. Is It's a solvent, so you could just use Gamsol or any odorless mineral spirits if you want to. Spike lavender is just uh, it's a his historical solvent. It's a old master solvent, uh, old master type solvent. Spike lavender was definitely available to Rembrandt back in the 17th century, along with turpentine, of course, but I'm not using turpentine since it's generally not as safe to have in the air as spike lavender. So I opt for spike lavender. But you don't have to use it, you can just use odorless mineral spirits. And can you buy it on Amazon? I believe so. Just make sure it's spike lavender. Spike lavender and not lavender brush cleaner. So those two can get kind of confusing. Hey, uh, let's see, deep ready. What is an affordable painting service for a beginner, uh, beginner oil painter? I see you use MDF boards, are they archival? They should be, um, and by should be, I'm not saying that they aren't archival. It's just that you, you never really know with the modern materials. If you can go for just wooden panels, uh, like, uh, I don't know, like birch wood or some kind of like original wooden panels, I'd suggest that would be the best for anyone beginning in oil painting. Okay. So now that I've placed the background in, it's going to change the way the face looks. So this is by no means finished. This is going to take a long time, more than one day, to take from this to where I want it to go. So uh, all the critics out there that might look at this image and say, that's totally not like the image that he's looking at, good job. You're correct. Uh, because this painting, this area is going to be the main focus. Putting something in for the background is going to change your perception of it, which is just a nice little optical illusion. But I will continue to develop these face, uh, the face here, depending on how things go with the live stream. Or I just may work on it off camera, then you'll see the finished image on Instagram. I'll see how it goes. Okay. All right, so now I'm mixing transparent mummy, which is an iron oxide red, a little bit of cadmium red, deep, cadmium red, deep old Holland. Transparent Mummy, and I'm just going to put a little bit of inf information here, here, and then some for the hair. And then we'll get into the skin tones. So let's see what this one will look like. So if you don't talk about painting, I will have to time you out of the uh, chat. So please just talk about painting. Don't talk about anything other than painting. There are other YouTube channels for other stuff. Hey Monster Gaming, the how do how to paint skin tone? If you watch the live the live uh, painting demonstration before this one, so the one where I started the face, you saw a lot of premixtures. I tend to use premixtures these days. There isn't really a definitive answer to that question on how to paint skin tones. It's uh, it's mainly about relating colors, working with color relationships. Try the least that you can to uh, color match. Instead, try to paint colors in, in relation to one another. 
The most important thing though to any color, color has three components, hue, value, chroma. Chroma is how bright is it? Hue is, is it uh, red, yellow, blue? Uh, value is how light or how dark it is. The most important thing is the value. So how light or how dark is it? Will gesso help increase my paint flow? Okay, so um, gesso is what you want to use to prepare your canvas, but gesso is not something to use while you're painting. I may have misunderstood that question. Uh, gesso, if you gesso your, so for example, if you have like a wooden panel, you want to gesso it to prepare it, of course if it's not already gessoed. Uh, adding extra gesso would be good, but you don't need like 15 coats of gesso, just three coats. I don't use, I'm not using any kind of gesso here. And I bought these, I bought the linen already oil primed, so I didn't have to do any um, any other preparations. Hey Jose, uh, Jose Francisco, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna add a little more of the solvent. And remember, solvent, it just helps to thin out the paint. Hey, Deep Ready, what are some masters you'd recommend for master studies for portraits? Um, I mean, other than Rembrandt, Diego Velasquez is a good one. Uh, let me think. Uh, Anthony Van Dyck. Um, Vermeer, of course. Caravaggio. A anyone before, say, the 20th century? would be good for master studies. Now clearly I'm gonna to have to add more for the shadow of his neck. Uh, I'm not gonna to get to that just yet. When I get into skin tones, I like to have a, a, the palette, the, the premixture is already established. So there is a gap here. And I'm gonna get to that. That'll probably be the first thing I get to when we get to the skin tones. Uh, let's see, okay, ask, what do you mean by oil primed? So these are oil primed uh, linens, meaning it's linen that was, uh, I guess you could say gessoed, but not really gessoed. Uh, the raw linen was stiffened with, I, I guess, PVA glue, and then they added, an, oil primer so like you would prepare any kind of surface you would prime it before you paint it um, just like regular house painting or something like that. that that's what oil primed means it means it was prepared with oil paint for oil painting Hey Ben, I wouldn't call this a second attempt. This is just the second layer or the second sitting. This is the second sitting of how, however many it's going to take. 
So if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see the finished result of this at some point in the future. Now, admittingly, I would have finished this by now if I wasn't uh, waiting to stream it. I typically take about like two weeks, I think, per per master study. I guess uh, head and shoulders master study. Sergeant would be a good one, definitely. Hey Oscar, is it a good idea to mix titanium white with lead white to create texture or do you recommend using some kind of medium as an impasto? I typically try to avoid using a medium as an impasto. Um, if you don't have access to lead white, then I would just use uh, Gamblin Flake White replacement. Try as much as you can to avoid using um, any kind of medium for the texture because that's when you can run into trouble. Just use the oil paint on its own. Well, I'm glad you like the painting tutorials. Oh, that's what you meant, the second attempt. I do have one Rembrandt that I had to do a second attempt. Uh, that was not this one, that was uh, a while ago. It was a different one. But now this is my first, let's just call it, I guess, first attempt at this one. So those of you that, that may not know the uh, importance of doing these studies, uh, historically, I bet you Rembrandt himself did master studies of, uh, I guess they, he, they call them master copies, but I tend not to use that word, of, of other paintings. It is a very antique way of learning but it, I, if you ask me, I think it's the, the best way that you can learn from your favorite painter is to study their work, get the ego out of it. Um, you know, the ego these days is like everything has to be your own original work and all of that stuff. Um, th this is not intended to be something highly original. This is a skill building exercise. Hey Bazwati, I'm glad this is satisfying for you. Hey Thomas, do you ever use limited palette? Uh, some would consider this a limited palette, yeah. Thanks Wendy. Um, so is this uh, Rembrandt technique? You can't really, one cannot really know uh, the Rembrandt technique. Now there's a lot of people that will say they know how to paint just like Rembrandt, but you can't really know. You can do x-rays and find out that he didn't do transfer drawings, so he did paint directly. And if you zoom into his paintings, you can actually see, you can actually see the uh, tone of the canvas. His tone was much darker than this. The, the tone that I used was a lighter gray. Okay, so now I'm going to cover some stuff for the hair. And I'm just going to mix and go for the hair. Usually I'll opt for some pre-mixtures, but at this point I just want to cover it and then get right back into the skin tones. Hey Oscar, you use silver white from Holbein and flake white from Williamsburg. Oh yeah, of course. Um, Williamsburg flake white, I have that one. 
I use that one a lot. I'm just uh, at the moment I'm using Rublev. Uh, Rublev lead white number one. So I'm just mixing as I go for the color of the hair. Now with each pass, I do not intend to finish the painting. However, I do try to, I strive for as close of a value as I possibly can. Hey Carol. Yeah, uh, this is uh, like I mentioned on Zoom. This is uh, there. There isn't a set schedule for these. This is whenever I get my camera stuff ready. I'm actually going to be zooming later today. One-on-one uh, -on -one zooming with one of my students at five, so I have to be ready by then. Thanks for finding this. Oh, thanks for subscribing. Uh, this is this is oil paint. So those of you wondering what I'm talking about um, with Carol, I, with my online classes I have different levels that in, involve group Zoom, so painting together on Zoom in a group, which is uh, what I was referring to with Carol, and then I have one-on-one -on -one Zoom, but that is limited to three, three students. The group Zoom is not limited, um, as, as many students that would like to paint with me on Zoom are able to. And that's on Tuesdays. But anyway, more information on that is in the is in the uh, is on my Patreon. And yes, I know the more stuff I add here, the less and less this starts to look correct. So the more of the environment that I add the less accurate this is going to look and that's that's fine this is a building process you have to be patient with this hey Bazwati, should I use spike lavender when painting light skin tones or uh, that doesn't really matter um, it won't affect the value spike lavender doesn't affect the value of your uh, colors at all Spike Lavender is just a solvent. It just thins the paint out, just like uh, mineral spirits. But a great question, though. Thank you for asking about Spike Lavender. And, and you don't buy it in a tube like this. I put it in this tube. Hey Ignited, uh, this is not water mixable, this is uh, just regular oil paints. Although nothing wrong with water mixable, I have used it in the past. And water mixable is great if you have any uh, you know, allergies to mineral spirits or allergies to solvents or things like that. Water mixable is the way to go. I'm glad that that was invented.
So I invite as many art-related questions as you have. There are no bad questions, as long as it's appropriate for art, of course. They ignited. Yeah, it is kind of like an enhanced Zorn palette. Uh, funny you asked that. I I was using the Zorn palette this morning with a studio painting, and I I have a lesson currently or a project in my online class where I'm having students use the Zorn palette for an entire painting. It's quite nice, the Zorn palette. So I, I see what you mean. This is kind of an enhanced Zorn palette. Hey, uh, Guang, uh, thanks for watching from China. I'm glad my videos help you. All right, so we got something for the hair now. So before, when there wasn't a background, this the painting was like yeah I guess I guess that's good it looks kind of like Rembrandt but not really uh, now putting in the background it's like whoa whoa what happened there so all that means is that every time you add more information into your painting it introduces another uncomfortable level to the painting uh, in portrait painting called the awkward stage so this added a whole nother awkward stage. Hey Miss White, uh, let's see, for this study how many brushes are you using? At the moment I just have two, two brushes but that's going to change soon. Uh, have I ever painted on gesso board Earl? Yes, I have. Uh, thanks for watching from Taiwan. Okay, so now let's get to the skin tones, the more fun part. So, as this is a rather small palette, I'm used to working on a much larger palette. I'm going to move this. We're going to start making some pre-mixtures. And when we get into the shadow tones, we're actually going to use some, some more medium. So uh, to the person that mentioned modified Zorn palette, you are absolutely correct. Uh, I'm only going to use Zorn palette colors, at least I'm going to try to only use Zorn palette colors. For the skin tones and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a, an array of different skin tones and I'm gonna pick and choose from those skin tones to push the face a little bit uh, more towards uh, realism uh, how do I clean my brushes good question but what I I use Gamsol um, you could use turpentine too, but I use Gamsol. Turpentine is actually stronger, at, uh, it's a little better for cleaning brushes if you have uh, the ventilation for it, but you don't really need it these days, uh, so I just use Gamsol. And then after Gamsol, I use uh, something called the Master's Soap. Master's Soap and brush cleaner with hot water. And it's a myth that you can't clean bristle brushes with water. That's a total myth. If someone tells you don't clean your brushes, your bristle brushes with uh, water, it's a total myth. Don't believe them. You can totally clean bristle brushes with water only after you used solvent. 
Solvent first, then hot water and soap. But good question, good question. I appreciate it. Hey Akutha, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for watching from India. Remember, I'm making pre-mixtures now, and I'm gonna pick and choose from these. So these are probably gonna span pretty much the entire form of the forehead, the form over here, the form down there. And I'm only using Zorn palette colors for my skin tones. Zorn palette colors involve lead white, yellow ochre, cadmium red, and black. I have Old Holland Cadmium Red Deep, and I have Old, oh, not Old, I have Old Holland Cadmium Red Deep. This is Blue Ridge Yellow Ochre Rublev. This is Lead White Number One Rublev, and this is a German Grape, or not Grapevine, this is, let me read it to you, a German Vine Black uh, Rublev. You can use dish soap. I used this soap for years. So this, these two dark values are probably going to be for the um, the shadow tones. Notice that it's not going to be straight black. Now the nice thing about using Zorn palette colors, uh, obviously I, I mentioned more about this in my online classes, but I'll give you a brief, uh, a, a little bit of information on it, is that when the colors go darker for the skin tones, they automatically get more transparent because you use less of your opaque colors. The opaque colors being um, the lead white and the cadmium red. So now I'm going to make another row of skin tones, but these are going to be pinkish, orangeyish skin tones. Remember, I'm going to pick and choose from these. Hey, Luna, I'm Dorum. Hello. Now this is what I opt to do for skin tones rather than mix and go. I prefer to have pre-mixtures. Obviously there'll be some mixing. Uh, I will be kind of picking and choosing and mixing on the canvas. Just like you saw last time. Hey, Ignited. Oh, thank you. You are too kind. Too kind. Now, a little tip about the Zorn palette, the four color palette. Make sure that you have the highest quality colors that you can for the Zorn palette and use Cadmium Red Deep. Don't use cadmium red light if you can avoid it. Just from personal experience. 
It works better with Cadmium Red Deep than Cadmium Red Light. And Old Holland's Cadmium Red Deep is like my absolute favorite. All right, so now we're gonna make greenish skin tones. And how do you get green from this? Yellow and black. Black and yellow. Let's see. Deep ready. Let's see. What pigments did Rembrandt use? How do we know he used lead white? What are your recommendations for uh, for a beginner learning art history? Okay, so for art history, I, uh, I I didn't major in art history when I was in college, so I'm gonna plead the fifth on that one. Uh, meaning I'm gonna just I, I'm not gonna even try to answer that question. But um, did Rembrandt use lead white? Yes, uh, and lead white was used long, long before. Uh, Rembrandt. Lead white was invented whew, a while back. I think um, I can't tell you exactly when. I'm not even going to pretend I know when, but you can actually see from art conservationists uh, research the amount of lead that was used in old master paintings. It's very archival. It definitely does stand the test of time. So through conservationist studies, you can basically see how much lead content was used. I think Rembrandt also used chalk. I know he used uh, genuine vermilion because they didn't have cadmium back then. We know he had yellow ochre because yellow ochre, the color I'm using right now, is like the basically like the ubiquitous yellow for skin tones it's it's like almost always used i don't know if rembrandt had access to genuine ultramarine blue i don't know if he did which is lapis lazuli i know that vermeer did uh, we know that there was another stone pigment that Rembrandt had for blue. I can't remember what it was called. And we know that uh, carbon black or ivory black was available back then. Raw umber was available back then. Lead tin yellow was available back then. <clears throat> And uh, that's all I know at the moment. Uh, all I can remember, should I say. Hey, Ignited. Let's see, one more question. When using water mixables, can I use water as the mixing solution? Or do I need water, uh, let's see. A water mixable uh, medium good question I would try to avoid using water to thin it out I think you are correct using a medium would help but water mixable oil paints are not <clears throat> excuse me they're not inherently as thick as uh, regular oil paints so you can probably get by with not using any medium at all for a long time all right, so now I'm going to mix the bluish gray colors and just ran out of lead white. Remember, don't mess with the lead white and you'll be fine. Paint with it, but don't mess with it. See, I'm not even touching the, the top of the tube, so I'll be perfectly fine. Hey, 
Hey, David Rodriguez, if you um, if we, you would like to look at the description box of the video, I have all of these colors listed. These colors are not listed because I have just uh, mixed them up. These are pre-mixed. So basically black, black and white and a little bit of yellow ochre. And this will probably be used for the sclera, the white of the eye. And uh, it'll just be used to cool off other colors too. Okay, so those that are commenting on the differences between my painting and the original, yes, I know, uh, mine is still a work in progress, uh, so I just won't respond. Okay, all right, so we got our pre-mixtures there. These are the regular looking skin tones, these. These are the reddish, the greenish, the bluish. If I wanted to, I could make an orangey column, but I don't think I'm gonna need to go that, that far. All right, so I'm gonna start off with, this is the brush that I was using earlier today. I'm just trying to dry clean it at the moment. A little bit of solvent. I'm gonna start off right in the shadow. See, we got a question. How long does your paintings uh, take to dry? About 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours, but usually 24 hours. Touch dry. To be completely dry, uh, about I'd say maybe two weeks if you want to be really specific about it now let's see how do you fix oversaturated paintings uh, limited palette might be the best way uh, if you paint over top of an area that's too saturated like if you accidentally use like cadmium yellow in the highlight or something like pure cadmium yellow that'll oversaturate it. If you use pure cadmium orange in the cheeks or whatever, that'll oversaturate it. If you put like phthalo blue in the shadows, that'll oversaturate it, you know what I mean? Hey Leo B. Oh good, I'm glad you're painting along with me. So adding the medium helps to thin out the paint. In the face, there's pretty much no solvent used. So if you find yourself dipping your brush periodically into your thinner while you're painting, try not to do that. Uh, one way to avoid that would be just don't have your solvent out in a cup, just have it in a little dropper like this. Hey 
Hey, Lillian. Uh, let's see. Luckily, a study doesn't have to be a perfect copy uh, in order to be a good teaching demo, right? Uh, let's see. I'm learning a lot just seeing how the palette is mixed. I'm glad that's helping you. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't have to be a perfect copy. I mean, I am going to push it closer to the original. But yes, you can definitely learn from doing these studies, even if it's not uh, that close to the original. But you should strive to make them as close as possible. Hey, Deep Freddy, can I use Payne's Gray to desaturate colors? I, I don't think I would do that. Um, I think instead of adding gray to uh, desaturate a color, uh, just my suggestion would be pre-mix them so that all you're doing is picking and choosing and I actually go between green and red to unsaturate colors a lot with skin tones I use complementaries a lot now you could go and use gray to desaturate a color while you're painting yeah but you don't have to explicitly do that. I'd recommend um, just relying on your premixtures. So for example, I just, I lessened the saturation there. I brought it down by just going from this kind of reddish color to the greenish color. I could use a gray. I do have grays here if I want to cool it down. Basically, whatever works. All I can ever do is just suggest things. But if you find that something works for you, then just use it. So it's about to be uh, that one hour point in the stream, so I'm going to take a break in about a couple minutes. Then I'll return and we'll paint for a little while longer.
And I recommend using medium in the shadows to thin out the shadows. And if you have less than like four or five layers, you can use a, a fast drying gel medium, like Venetian medium. Ignited, uh, what do you recommend for a palette? Is a glass based one recommended? It's up to you. I mean, um, I like handheld palettes. Uh, I use handheld palettes. My uh, earlier today, I was using a handheld palette. It's I I put it in the refrigerator so that the colors wouldn't dry on me. That's only temporary, though. I'm gonna later on tonight. I will clean up the palette. Good question, though. I I really love palettes. Um, you can use anything. Just make sure that it's large enough. This is too small. I wouldn't recommend something this small. This is only for the sake of uh, the video. Uh, 16 by 20 inches is a good size for a palette. New Wave brand makes a lot of nice palettes. Also this brand called Turtlewood. It's not made out of turtles, it's just the name, Turtlewood. Okay, so it's been about an hour, so what I'm going to do is take a short break. Okay, so you are now going to see this image on your screen. This doesn't mean I'm gone. This just means that I will be back in a couple minutes. So I'm just going to take a break for a couple minutes, uh, just stretch, drink some water, and then I will return. Uh, canvas size, good question. This is uh, 11 by 14 inches. So remember, I will be back in a few minutes.
All right, I have returned after my break. All right, I am back. So let's answer some questions. Uh, so Miss White asks, I noticed the value of the shadow you apply is darker than the original painting shadow. Is this, uh, let's see, or is it just camera effect? Good question, it's the camera. So for example, okay, so if I do that, that's two clicks, I guess, lighter. You can now see that the background is not as dark, but I have it that way because I have it set this way because the camera, uh, it's not very good, or at least I'm not that good with cameras. So I want the highlight not to be overly blasted out. So that's why I have it set that way. Um, so let me just adjust my uh, photo reference here. Okay, all right, so I'm back. I brought some of the previous Rembrandts for show and tell, the previous Rembrandt studies, so you can see where this one is heading. You have you may have seen all of these on YouTube, so here's one. Here's another one. There's two. Three would be this one and four so this is the one where i needed to have a second attempt this one has sunken in dramatically so i have to um, uh, i guess varnish it at this point it's completely dry and i have a couple other ones i have two other ones that are smaller but as you see i've definitely been doing a lot of rembrandt studies in order to improve my own painting abilities so let's return to painting and please feel free to ask any art related questions let me just quickly double check that my audio is working Let's check the audio and visuals. Everyone's still with me? All right, I'm gonna need at least, at least three people to let me know that we're still connected, that we still have um, internet connection here. I need three volunteers at least. Just write that the video is working or the video is not working. Or if you have a question, then that, that works fine as well. So on my end, the camera seems to be working. There we go, we got one. Hey, Deep Ready, thank you. Uh, Lillian, thank you. All right, Miss White, good, good. And, uh, Will Dar 27. All right, good, good. Hey, Grant Lester. Well, there's quite a bit more warmth in this shadow. And as someone noticed before, it does appear, this does appear darker as a whole than it is in person and that's just because of the camera hey Kanye Art Grant Lester I'm doing well thank you for asking I hope you're doing well as well So right now I'm just strengthening the shadows, remember. Hey Tidjal, uh, hello there. Monster Gaming, hello. And someone asked a really good question earlier about how long do the paintings take to dry 
And I want to elaborate a little more into that. Typically, in the earlier layers, this is only the second layer, so I want this to dry relatively fast. And I want it to be um, relatively lean, meaning not too much medium. So in the earlier layers, I use little to no medium as you're seeing. The, the light of the skin tone will have no medium, only the shadow. And I'm only using medium in the shadow to thin it out. Okay, so someone asked which color name, uh, which, so if you mean the colors that I'm using, these colors up here, these are listed in the description box for you in, in detail. The color and the brand is listed for you along with the medium, which is this one. These are not listed in the description, these are pre-mixtures. So these were done uh, earlier in the stream. And remember, <clears throat> excuse me, this is not going to be a, this is not an action-packed live stream by any means. It's, it's not, it's not meant to be like some, like a roller coaster ride. This is meant to be a virtual painting session. So if you have a sketchbook uh, or you're painting along with me, just uh, draw or paint with me. Hey Deep Ready, how many sessions do you do for each painting on average? I'd say a face takes me like four or five, sometimes sometimes more. A painting that's like head down to hands will take me like double that. This is very much a easy does it kind of approach. Not a lot of stuff happens very quickly. Hey Danielle, oh, oh, welcome, let's see, first time here, a uh, great artist, really enjoy your videos, thanks for sh uh, sharing, well thank you for watching, and yeah, feel free to get a sketchbook out, uh, or some, some oil paints, or whichever paints you have, and draw along with me. Right now I'm, I'm fixing the chin, uh, there needs to be more of an angle for the chin. And there's usually a lot of greenish gray around the mandible, especially in Rembrandt's.
So I'm just working with the shadows and the dark lights at the moment. Just shadows and dark lights. Someone asked me uh, earlier, I don't know if it was in this stream or, or another, if I would prefer to paint these in the museum from life. I would love to, if I could observe these images in person, or these uh, paintings in person. I don't think I'd be able to live stream there in the museum. Especially with the amount of time it takes me to complete a painting. Hey Danielle, the other paintings you showed us, did you do videos on, ma on um, making them? Yes. Each of those that you saw has a, has a pre-recorded video, it has a YouTube video on it. Now those weren't live streamed, those were just pre-recorded. This is the first Rembrandt study that I've done uh, live, I think. I might have done another at some point in the past, but I can't remember. David Rodriguez, how many color, let's see, how many color palettes are there for portrait? Which one do you like the most? That is a very good question, and that answer changes from time to time. Um, whoo, there, there are so many different palettes for portrait painting, I couldn't even begin to count them. But I say that the most uh, popular and the most, I guess, beginner friendly one is the Zorn palette. So lead white, yellow ochre, cadmium red deep, and uh, black. Ivory black, or what I'm using is a German vine black. But basically just cadmium red deep, ivory black, white, and then yellow ochre. That's, at the moment, that's my favorite palette to use. That answer changes a lot though. Uh, I will tell you, depending on what time of the week you ask me, you may have a different answer. What I like about the Zorn palette, or just limited palettes in general, is the unity or the sense of harmony that you get within your colors. Uh, it's, it's a really nice effect, whereas sometimes, you know, I've done paintings where, like, uh, the nose is a little bit too yellow, or the forehead is a little bit too green, or something is just a little too saturated. Um, the Zorn palette, or just any limited palette like this one, it kind of helps to uh, minimize that by bringing unity. But good question, good question. Hey Deep Ready, uh, we are allowed to take paints into a museum and have set up just no oh no 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 you can't uh just sit a good question excellent question no 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 you can't just you can't just bring paints into the museum and sit there and paint you have to be approved by the museum you have to fill out an application it's kind of like a job application you have to fill out to be approved to paint in the museum not all museums 
might be like that, but I don't know one that isn't like that. Most of them are like that. But good question, excellent question. Hey Daniel, oh thank you. Uh, so Rembrandt, one of the reasons I'm studying Rembrandt so much is I I think of him as one of the best if not the best portrait painter of all of history and that's just my opinion. Uh, Rembrandt is just like the epitome of portrait painting. Like anytime I think of portrait painting I think of Rembrandt um, and a lot of painters, even Sargent, John Singer Sargent uh, studied Rembrandt very closely. Rembrandt and Diego Velazquez very closely. So the uh, what I want is to do so many Rembrandt studies that I just memorize them. In the future, in the back of my mind, I'm going to have these Rembrandt images in my head. I don't want to copy his style or anything like that, but I want to learn from what he did in a way that I wouldn't learn anywhere else if if I didn't study his painting so closely. Uh, good question. Is it the same for sketching? Uh, it depends, I think. You know, if you're bringing a pencil and a sketch pad, you can do that. Uh, I don't think that museums, most museums have any problems with that. Uh, but if you bring a large uh, drawing pad, an easel, uh, a bunch of charcoal or something like that, then they might have a problem with it. But I'd, I'd hate to speak for someone else, so I don't, I don't really know. It depends on the museum. A little too much width for his forehead. Now the camera is at a slight angle uh, relative to relative to you, so it might look a little more narrow than it looks like to me, but I, I feel like I have to make the head a little more narrow anyway. Hey Miss White, um, you can say this is Ala Prima but by ala prima it is wet on wet so if i put so for example if i was to keep painting onto this it would be ala prima but this would be considered um, not ala prima this would be considered uh, wet onto dry i'm painting on dry on a dry painting ala prima just means painting wet on wet it also just means all in one sitting Hey Danielle, uh, what is the name of the second color besides the white? Uh, yeah, no, no worries. Uh, this one is yellow ochre. It's Blue Ridge yellow ochre from uh, from Rublev.
So this is basically just one small change at a time. Patience is key with this. And this builds your patience. Now with my online students, I, I build my students up from more simple projects to more complex ones. But I mean, at, at any point, if you want to start a master study, by all means do it. It's a very good learning exercise. Deep Ready, what is what was the first master study you ever did? Do you still have it? Good question. The probability of it existing is almost zero. A lot of my older paintings uh, get reused or just disappear from the face of the earth. Um, so I think my first master study was probably a sergeant, a John Singer sergeant. I might have done when I was like 17. And I, I see a little bit of a cooler color here on the corner of his cheek, but you know, I think that's actually the tone of the canvas showing through. All right, so I'm gonna change brushes now and we're gonna to start to paint in the lights. So I'm just using size two uh, Filbert bristle brushes, Silver Brush Grand Prix. They're pretty used up, fairly beat up. But they work. And they're just beat up from being used so much. And yes, you can use like a cool bluish color, cross it with these colors. As someone asked before, if you can use like a Payne's gray, you could use it in the same way, but try to think of it as a cooling factor, but not a desatur des desaturization. I don't know if that's even the right pronunciation. If that's even a word. And his nose is a little more flat than this. I have his nose pointing down a bit too much. Hey David Rodriguez, I think I like the Ella Prima technique. What tips would you give me to do it correctly? Um, so for Alla Prima technique, number one, you have to be a master at drawing. Uh, so to make to have an Alla Prima work correctly, meaning to create a painting all in one sitting, you have to be like John Singer Sargent style, or sorry, John Singer Sargent level of drawing to get that to work. Um, that is why I don't even mess with that. I've done it in the past, but never quite that successfully. Um, and Alla Prima relies heavily on your intuition of drawing. So that could be one of the worst exercises, I think, 
in trying to learn portrait painting is to try to do it a la prima, meaning trying to do it all in one sitting is a definite no-no. Uh, if you want to learn classical painting or realist painting in general, what I recommend is doing a more classical approach where you draw it, uh, you study the outlines carefully, you transfer it, and you really work up the layers. Uh, and then you can build into doing a la prima. And I, and I apologize in how I word it because I'm trying the best that I can to be as nice as I can about it, uh, David, but a la prima as a method of creating painting is really not recommended for portraiture. Um, you can make a painting look a la prima, David, you certainly can make a painting look a la prima by putting in multiple, multiple layers. Uh, Sargent did that. And even John Singer Sargent warned against trying to create a painting all in one sitting. Um, you know, and he's known for a la prima. So just uh, take it with a grain of salt. I, I care about you. I care about all of you that are watching my videos. I know I'm not a very popular YouTuber. I'm not a, you know, a big YouTube sensation or anything like that. I know that my following is not that large, but everyone that does follow me, I think is very interested in learning. So that's why I need to apologize when I say things like that, but I only say it for your own benefit because I care. Hey, uh, Deep Ready. Oh, no problem. Uh, no problem with the questions. I encourage all art questions. Of course, as long as it's art related. Uh, let's see. Do you varnish all your paintings? How do you reuse a varnished painting? If that's possible, do you recommend varnishing all your paintings, even if they're just practice? Okay, so you don't have to varnish all your paintings, especially if they're just practice paintings. I certainly don't. But if you do want your painting to survive the test of time, then yeah, I would varnish it. Um, I use Gamvar picture varnish. I wait about a month, uh, but really you can just varnish the painting after it's touched dry with Gamvar. If you want to use the more traditional one, which is Damar, you have to wait the full six months, which is why I use Gamvar. And uh, no, you cannot reuse a varnished painting. Um, that's a definite no-no. Uh, you don't want to reuse a uh, varnished painting. Once it's varnished, it's a done deal. Um, art conservationists can remove varnish, and varnish is actually supposed to be removed when uh, the painting is undergoing conservation. But it, it shouldn't be done unless you're an art conservationist. Okay, so at this point I have a light brush and I have a dark brush. The light brush has little to no medium. So what I want everyone that's interested in these streams to, uh, to get out of this is that you know, even though this is not a lesson by any means, I want you to see the uh, the patience involved in building up a painting like this. But I also want you to know that it is a process. It's not something that's supposed to be quick and simple, uh, quick and easy does it kind of thing. It's not like that. And trust me, I think a la prima um, 
is way above my skill level. To be able to complete a painting in one sitting, a portrait painting even, um, not even possible. Uh, I just, I wouldn't be able to do it. I can make it look decent. I can do a sketch. Most demonstration paintings are deceptive in, in that, um, you know, they're done quickly, they're supposed to look attractive, they're supposed to look very skillful and masterful, but really all the artist is trying to do is make something as impressive as quickly as possible so that they can get more students to take their workshops, is why they do those demos. But they're deceptive because they don't actually work that way. The paintings are deceptive, not the painters. I'm actually going to move the eye a little bit to the right. I have it uh, too far to the left. So I'm going to push it a little further to the right, and then I'm going to move the iris. No problem, David. I'm sorry if it's not the advice you wanted to hear. I care about you, man. The best thing, remember, if you're learning portrait, if you're learning painting, the best thing is the classical approach. Even John Singer Sargent, he attended a Col de Bazaar. He did the classical approach. The careful transfer drawings and building up the layers now someone that is an expert I think at uh, Alla Prima or who was an expert at Alla Prima was Bob Ross and of course his his teacher Bill Alexander that was Alla Prima in its purest form uh, it was done to have a certain look for the landscapes in a reasonable amount of time, usually 30 minutes. But to do that for a portrait, no way. Hey Deep Ready, do you recommend any exercises for getting better at values? Good question. I do, I would suggest doing uh, monochromatic, monochromatic, so underpaintings. In the classical approach, you do monochromatics in the classical approach. So that helps you get better with values automatically. 
You could also do cast drawings, cast paintings. Now I'm going to get a sable brush out. Now it's going to look a little a little strange at first because I am moving such small stuff. Eventually it'll look somewhat correct. Hey David I just think the result of an Ella Prima painting is awesome, but I think we can get the same result doing it the classical way, right? Exactly. Perfect, perfect reasoning right there, David. I applaud you. Definitely. That is correct. You can get the Ella Prima look using a classical approach without the stress of trying to create the entire thing all in one go. Exactly. Well said. Now that we've moved the eye slightly, we can start to add some details for it. Obviously the tear duct is going to need to move a little bit. Hey, uh, yeah, thank you. And even at this point, you know what I'm going to say, we're just getting started with this. It is a very patient process, but relaxing. I'd say this is a relaxing thing. Remember, I'm adding medium to the darks, but not the light. Hey, I, uh, yes, these are oil paints. Now everyone, you see how useful the premixtures are. You see how I'm just picking and choosing and it allows me to move with much more freedom of mixing as I'm going on the painting.
All right, so before long, now that we're using the sables, we should return to the nose. All of the brushes that I'm using, minus the background brush, are all from the same brand, Silver Brush. Let's see, I, uh, what about the end of the painting? The, you mean the completion of the painting? This, this won't be completed today, that's for sure. So I'm building up the shapes from the midtones now. So we started off with the shadows as we retouched the painting, and then we went into the midtones, which is where we're at right now. But this will still take a little longer. Oh, you mean from the bottom? Oh, good. Uh, that, yeah. I'm probably going to fill that in later. Not on camera because it just it would take too long. On camera, I'm trying to do all the fun stuff. The portrait. Hey David, it's still difficult for me to mix the right color. Um, you change the color a lot during the process. I would definitely encourage you to try the uh, try these premixtures. It helps to keep the colors organized. Now, in the past, I used to just mix and go, um, but this is just a lot easier. Uh, there's there's more control you know like I just went from the darker reddish now to the greenish now to the darker reddish Though it's not good for your eyes, it's recommended to squint. Make sure you stand back or sit back and squint. All right, so I'm gonna change back to the bristle brushes. And so we've managed to do a lot, but not, of course, not anywhere near completing the painting. And at, at, at some point, we didn't get there yet, but at some point in the painting, I reach a point where I don't know what to do. And that's where all of the new learning, the new stuff basically happens when you don't know what to do. I'm not there yet. Um, I, I can see so many different things that need to be adjusted. But at some point, the painting is going to get so close in my eye to the original that I'm not going to know what to do. And then that's when I make discoveries. That's the joy of doing master studies. Anyway, now that we're uh, talking about that, I want the conversation to be 
all about art so I'm going to ask everyone here that's watching a question so if you could study any painter very closely in history so like I'm studying Rembrandt who would you study very closely who would be the painter that you would choose so in other words if you could study with any artist in history who would it be and maybe you can add a little why David Rodriguez, Sergeant, of course. <laughs> Let's see if we can add a Y to that one. But remember, everyone, the question is if you could study with any painter in history, who would it be? That question also means if you would be doing master studies of uh, one artist in particular in history, who would it be and why? Because this is as close as I can get to studying with Rembrandt. Deep ready, Da Vinci, because those beautiful sculptures. Good answer, good answer. Hey David B. Winslow Homer because he lived near me. Oh, awesome. So Danielle, Rembrandt, because you like the Rembrandt style, I can certainly relate to that. Miss White, uh, let's see, Soroya, because you love his colors, yeah, Soroya is amazing. E. Buzz Miller Rubens for his drawing. Yep, Peter Paul Rubens was one of my teacher, my teacher John De Martin, uh, one of his favorite uh, artists of all time. He would always bring printouts of his uh, his drawings in class. Danielle, is it okay to use recipe books for mixing different colors? I have one for skin tones. 
or should I learn to feel the colors? Anything that works, Daniel. Um, you know, if you find that using recipes for the colors helps you, then then it helps you. Then that's good. Um, but I would, and in my opinion, I, I think I would suggest uh, trying to learn to mix them for a specific painting. So, like for uh, for like a like the Rembrandt, as you're seeing, like each one of these. Is supposed to match some part of his his skin tones and I just usually use his forehead for this band of value here or color hey hi man uh, Thanks for watching from Bogota, Colombia. Hey Aya, uh, names of books that will help you study art. Um, yeah, I'd say Vanderpool for drawing. So I'm actually responding to everyone through my iPad that's below here. Let's see. I probably won't spell his name right. I'm going to write Vanderpool for drawing. And I found this is one of the most helpful books, I think, to learn art, in particular for drawing. All right, so before I get into the lights that much, I think I should uh, just drop the brushes for now. I mean, I'm still going to work a little more on this today, but by no means am I going to finish it. So the next time we stream, we may start a new one or we may be working on this one again. It depends. But in any case, if you want to see the finished version of this, please check out my Instagram. Even though Instagram apparently is changing their uh, format, but you should still be able to see my images there. Alright, so I'm going to drop the brushes now, putting the brushes down. Let's see if, you, if there are any questions. So I'm going to sign out in a little bit. One question that might arise is when am I going to stream again? The answer to that question is I don't have a fixed schedule just yet. I'm spending a lot of time in my studio works and in my online classes. Uh, I spend a lot of time with my students. Um, so if you're interested in the online classes, please check out the, uh, the description box for a link to that. But I do plan on streaming again at some point soon. 
And like I said, maybe we will maybe we will work on this one or maybe we'll start another one. Good question, uh, Danielle. So, yes, I do not know. I don't know when I will do the next stream, so I apologize for that. Like I said, I'm not on a, a fixed schedule right now, but it should be, I'd say, in the near future. Uh, but please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't, and it'll give you an update. Make sure to click on the notification settings, and it should... Uh, let you know when I do stream live. The footage from this will be available on YouTube as a pre-recorded video for you. So if you missed part of this stream live, you can definitely uh, re-watch it. And definitely watch it and re-watch it and share it to your friends if you don't mind, if you find this helpful. Hey Christine, uh, beginners class, yep, I have a beginners project that does the uh, process that I mentioned where you draw the outlines and then you build the values uh, little by little. I also create drawing templates for my students for the uh, very uh, early to uh, beginning lessons, so yep, definitely, I have that in my classes. Well, thank you, Danielle. So I'm going to hang out for just another minute, then I'll sign out. And like I said, I do aim to do these streams more often. And uh, again, thank you everyone for your great comments, your excellent questions. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, yeah, and there's more information on it in the uh, uh, on the Patreon page. Yep, thanks for watching David and thanks for watching everyone so now I'm officially going to sign out so thank you so much for watching I wish you the very best in all of your artwork and remember if you found this stream to be helpful please check out my online classes on patreon and also subscribe to my youtube channel so you can have notifications for when I go live again or whenever I upload another YouTube video. I wish you all the very best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.